Um, let me, if I could, actually introduce our panel and thank you all very much for, for coming. Um, as Serge mentioned, and you heard our panelists earlier this morning um, discuss, uh, democracy is under pressure now more than ever before, um, particularly in Western Europe um, in the wake of the very significant economic crises that have beset the continent over the last several years. Um, our panel is going to uh, set about trying to focus today specifically on how economic turmoil subverts democracy. And here Greece and the European Union are, are obvious cases in point. Um, again, amid the massive economic crisis that we have seen in Europe and the United States, democracy seems to have lost its momentum. It has revealed fundamental weaknesses in Western political systems. The crisis has also weakened entitlement and social welfare systems across Europe, and it has also left huge debts that threaten a return to well-being for current and future generations. Austerity has not responded very well to society's needs either. To the contrary, as Mr. Venizelos pointed out this morning, as pressure from unemployment, declining standards of living, and an erosion of the European social model have accelerated amid a focus on fiscal imperatives, people have become disillusioned with their political systems. And that has pushed some governments toward a crisis of legitimacy. Citizens feel helpless also as bankers appeared to get away with little punishment. In the meantime, institutions were challenged. As we heard earlier this morning, financial markets appeared to hold governments hostage cornering some leaders into hasty decisions that have impacted society. Markets also affected democracy in unexpected ways in Europe. For example, in Italy, at the height of the Euro crisis, we saw the democratically elected prime minister replaced with a technocratic leadership. Certainly, as we heard this morning as well, the social turmoil that has arisen from Europe's long-running debt crisis has created fertile ground in the European Union for populist parties whether the National Front in France, where I am based, the Party for Freedom in the Netherlands, Golden Dawn here in Greece, and, as we saw last night in Sweden, big gains there for the far right. All of these parties give voice to a frustration within societies that current political leadership seems to be failing them. In the United States, by contrast, economic turmoil has not given rise to extreme forces but shortly after the crisis, the Tea Party there has had sharp influence on the economic and social debate. In the United States, we have also seen financial institutions rise in influence once again, and a further polarization of society between the wealthy and the poor, with the middle class eroding, similar to what we are seeing in Europe. All the while, as we heard earlier today as well, China has continued to expand its economic might during the crisis in the West and in the coming decades could challenge the West as never before, with further implications for the West's economies, societies, and politics. So amid the large number of economic crises we are seeing, the question that we want our panel to address today is whether democracy is in fact delivering as it should, and can democracy deliver as it should amid these crises. And we are very pleased to have an expert panel to address this, starting with a man who needs no introduction, Kostas Simitis, the former Prime Minister of Greece. We are also lucky to have Eleni Kunalakas Tsakopoulos, who is the former American ambassador to Hungary, Hungary um, and a very interesting situation in Hungary that has teachable lessons for the rest of Europe that she will be able to uh, shed light on for us. Um, Vuk Jeremik, who is the president of the former president of the United Nations General Assembly, and currently the president of the Center for International Relations and Sustainable Development, and another woman who needs no introduction, but I will introduce her anyway, Dora Bakoyanis, who is the former Minister of Foreign Affairs in Greece, and many other uh, things here. I mean, Mr. Simitis, since since you uh, took the lead, let me hand the floor back over to you, if I may, and you know, just ask you to address, uh, you know, the extent to which in your view, uh, the economic crisis that we have seen in Europe has been linked to basic, how much it is linked to a sort of wider political failure of European states and the European Union to deal with serious problems. Thank you. Second time is the best. <laughs> so, 
ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, if democracy means that parliament operates normally, laws are passed and election results represent the will of the people, then democracy in European countries has functioned smoothly in spite of the crisis. But if democracy means decent standard of living for all and the potential and opportunities for a better life and social justice, then the economic crisis has undoubtedly had a negative impact on democracy. The evidence is apparent in the unprecedented number of unemployed in Greece and Spain and in other countries. The economic crisis is linked to the wider political failure of the European states and the European Union to deal with serious problems such as regional inequalities with the Union, the absence of economic governance for the Eurozone, the issue of immigration and the lack of control over capital movement in globalized markets. The European leaders defer actions avoid clear-cut decisions and insist on the institutional setup, though it is not adapted anymore to the new European reality. The economic and political crisis in both the European Union and the Member States interconnect, intertwine and interact. An example of the connection between the political and economic crisis in Greece was the huge amount of resources squandered on serving party interests and awarding jobs to party supporters. It was the main cause of the derailment. A major cause of the crisis in the Eurozone was the political reluctance of the member states and the Central European Bank to exercise effective control over banks. The crisis in its various forms is a consequence of a major social and economic change of globalization, the shrinking power of the nation state, the introduction of new technologies and the need of society and its institution to adapt to new circumstances. Tackling this issue demands new modes of operation for society, the redistribution of funds, structural changes and new forms of social policy. But changes spark social unrest and have encountered a wave of, op of opposition that comes from diverse groups in society and encompasses many different mutually incompatible opinions and aims. In a predominantly middle-class society, where class differences are no longer acute, the major political parties are inclusive. They represent diverse social groups with different and opposing views. Consequently, the party discourse is generic, abstract, and as non-specific as possible. Parties plan only for the short term, any changes they announce on major issues are limited to a few interventions. Therefore, when parties assume power, they address the problems of the day and postpone any substantive solutions. Such a behavior has a negative impact on democracy. It is the cause of the economic and social crisis. The growing strength of parties like the Greek neo-fascist party Golden Dawn that challenge the existing democratic system is a result of the populist tactics and the continuous exaggeration employed by the traditional parties. Resentment rises in the absence of noticeable successes and of the courage to speak plainly. A fundamental change on the European level is necessary. A proper economic governance structure should be established. The euro area countries have to decide on policy moves and constitutional reforms that will permit them to tackle the crisis and the democratic deficit of the Union. As far as Greece is concerned, needed is a policy for development, employment, 
incomes, the environment, and the everyday life of the people. Policy which does not offer generalities and soothing assurances, but which presents specific, economically feasible measures with social sensitivity and with an evaluation of their consequences and overall contribution to growth. Thank you. Thank you very much. Eleni, you were the American ambassador to Hungary appointed by President Obama during a very pivotal moment um, in that country's history a mo uh, and a moment that actually would seem to hold teachable lessons for other European countries. Tell us what your view is uh, based on your experience there. Well, first of all, let me just say, Liz, what an incredible honor it is to be here, and especially among this very distinguished panel. Um, I'm a Greek-American, and my life in the United States was very, uh, in part, devoted to the question of democracy and Hellenism. My husband and I founded two chairs in Hellenism at Georgetown and at Stanford. But I did not expect in 2010, when I arrived in Hungary, that advocating for democracy, talking about democracy, engaging on this issue was going to be part of my job. And I think that it is clear that the, Democrat, the uh, economic crisis of 2008 that hit um, Hungary led to um, a, a series of events that made it necessary for me to engage in this way. Uh, before I go back to 2010, what I thought would be useful is just to, um, to quote uh, Prime Minister Viktor Orban from a speech that he just gave in July. Because I want to be clear that this is not, I don't think, a subjective analysis of where the Prime Minister um, is coming from in his political uh, philosophy, but what he is plainly stating for all to hear. Uh, he says this, a trending topic in thinking is understanding systems that are not Western, not liberal, not liberal democracies, maybe not even democracies, and yet are making nations successful. Today, the stars of international analysis are Singapore, China, India, Turkey, and Russia. We, uh, he goes on to say, are searching for, and we are doing our best to find, parting ways with Western European dogmas, making ourselves independent from them. And then he goes on to say that he is looking for new ways to govern that are capable of making us competitive in this great world race. So I really believe that these, these words stand for themselves. And of course, they echo um, what we talked about in the last panel, uh, the China model, and uh, also called the Beijing consensus. So um, now going back to the elections in 2010, um, because you've asked us to talk kind of specifically about economic downturns and democracy. Um, the crisis was largely believed by the Hungarian people to be the responsibility and the fault of the socialist government. And so Viktor Orban and the Fidesz, KDMP, Christian uh, coalition, came into power with a two-thirds supermajority. In the four, first four years, in their first term, they adopted a new constitution and 700 new or amended laws, essentially rewriting the legal infrastructure of the country and how institutions were, were run. This prompted the United States along the way to raise concerns over the impact of these reforms and the process on Hungarian democracy. Um, but also along the way, um, they were addressing this question of um, hung Hungarian economy, the Hungarian economy, and in particular, um, the way that um, the Hungarian people um, were able to survive in this dire economic downturn. Um, Viktor Orban and his supermajority passed legislation um, that rewrote the forex loans, the foreign exchange loans, which created um, immediate relief to the Hungarian uh, uh, borrowers, of which there were many who had these forex loans. And then they also went in, um, bought out uh, one of the major gas delivery uh, uh, companies, and slashed gas prices to the people. 
So in 2014, again, going back to this question of, of, um, uh, of the elections, the effect on, on, on elections, uh, Viktor Orban, as two-thirds majority, was voted back into power by the Hungarian people, again, with a two-thirds majority. So this is in spite of the fact that there was um, widespread concern over the direction of Hungarian democracy, and even by um, his own admission, the Prime Minister is saying that he's looking to different models for economic success in the country. Um, now, I, I do not believe that all is lost in Hungary. I really do believe that it's important to say that. I was there for long enough to see that Hungarian people are freedom-loving people. Um, but I do think that there is cause for concern. Uh, I also would be remiss, um, since so far I'm the only panelist from the United States, um, to just say a few words about what's happened in the United States um, with our uh, great recession, the greatest economic downturn in the United States since the recession, the Great Depression in 1929. Um, you know, we recognize very well that uh, there are some significant issues of concern, certainly um, the degree to which our middle class has been negatively affected by this downturn, and that even in the recovery, they are not benefiting as much as um, you know, for instance, the, the stock market has come back, but, um, but the average American is not benefiting directly from that. Um, but I believe, and I think many first-generation Americans hold this view, um, in the uh, ability of the United States to stand up to meet its challenges. And my sense is, is that the upcoming elections in 2016, the question of income inequality is going to be very much front and center. And I'll also note that even in the last um, four years, uh, as our country has grappled with the challenges of our recession, um, we've seen some important, um, important changes. I think the health care law that we adopted after decades um, of, of people working toward universal health care in our country um, is a very, very important um, thing to note. And I also think that it's, that it's important to recognize that um, Still around the world, um, entrepreneurs uh, who have the opportunity to start their business in the United States will still more than likely prefer to be there than anywhere else because of our system of rule of law, because of the fact that um, uh, businesses have uh, transparency, they don't have some of the um, problems that plague newer democracies. Uh, with, um, with corruption and unpredictability. Um, so we still have uh, some tools in our toolbox and elements of our country. But um, it's been said, and I really liked um, what one of the previous speakers, Christopher Freeland, said, that we should be thinking of democracy not as a noun, but as a verb. And I think that's very uh, astute of her to say, because it is. You know, we, we cannot take democracy for granted. It is government of the people, by the people, for the people. The people have to be involved and have to work vigilantly in order to ensure that, in fact, it does uh, deliver for people and, uh, and continues to be um, perceived in the world uh, as it should be, as the best system to provide the most um, for the most number of people. So thank you. Thank you so much. I mean, that really is a central question is how well is democracy delivering for, peop delivering for people and, and how are citizens seeing it deliver for them? Vuk, as the former president of the United Nations General Assembly, you also have a wider step back view on the impact that economic crises would have had on democratic institutions. Why don't you give us your perspective on what's happening there? Well, thank you, Elise. But uh, first and foremost, I want to say that uh, it's a great privilege to to be with uh, such a distinguished uh, participants at the panel and uh, and back in Greece, which is for for many reasons like my my second home, to talk about democracy in Athens on on the Day of Democracy and International UN Day of Democracy. And I remember last year. Uh, exactly one year ago, uh, I was the president of the General Assembly and I was presiding over a special session in the UN discussing about democracy. And, uh, and it was a remarkable experience because uh, a lot of people were talking and, and, and they were saying very different things. And democracy indeed means 
different thing to different societies and different and different people. And it was really a humbling experience. But uh, we do definitely live in a in an era which is uh, you know uh, fraught with difficulty, economic, political, geopolitical difficulty. The world is indeed in flux, and it seems like a, a certain period uh, that followed the end of the Cold War, which ended in eighty nine. It's coming to an end. We still don't have a good name for this era, but it's definitely coming to an end. This is what most people believe. And uh, as it is coming to an end, an increasing number of people are raising uh, the question of, uh, is it really the democracy that we understood uh, back at the end of the Cold War? Is it really going to be the... uh, the system of the future, and some of the panelists uh, addressed some of the public concerns, uh, even by some world leaders, raised in public about about that. Our previous panel also discussed it very eloquently in certain when it comes to certain countries. But uh, what's definitely, I would say, at stake is uh, whether democratic systems are going to show their resilience. Uh, facing the deep economic crisis, probably the worst economic crisis that we've had since, uh, since the late 20s of the last century. And uh, I'm, in that sense, I am an optimist. I am, I am somewhat biased. The way I entered into public service and exchanged my uh, career in, uh, in physics and math with, with the career in public service was actually to engage in a democratic revolution back home in Serbia, it was in order to overthrow an autocratic government and introduce democracy. And uh, uh, Christia, in the previous panel, did raise a very good question as to what comes after you introduce a democratic system or introduce a certain um, freedoms uh, just following uh, autocracy. And things can go terribly wrong um, there are recent examples, uh, especially in the Middle East, of uh, things not going, let's say, as well as we would have all hoped following overthrow of certain dictatorial regimes. In our case in Serbia, it did go well. And it also went to the heart of a question raised a little earlier about do you introduce the fringe parties? Do you introduce the... Um, I'd say, um, repercussions of uh, the economic uh, crisis like the extreme parties in some European countries. Do you introduce them into the system? Or do you introduce into the system perhaps uh, the parties who have just rooted out through, for example, a democratic revolution? Well, in case in Serbia, it did work out quite nicely. Uh, As a matter of fact, uh, Serbia is now run by the parties who we have um, had to overthrow through a democratic revolution. Revolution, they were involved in the system from the very beginning. And as the system was uh, developing and maturing, these parties have gone through a transformation. And now these parties are leading the country on its way to the European membership. They are, as a matter of fact, doing a very good job uh, right now. But the question is, really, when it comes to democracy and, uh, and, and, and whether they are resilient to economic difficulties, to the realities of the economic crisis, is what exactly do you mean by democracy? And you're bound to have different answers in different countries and different societies. It's definitely not only about holding elections, because elections may be held, but they may not be free. Or even if they're free, they're not necessarily fair. Uh, And the way that they're conducted, there's also a huge debate about how they are to be conducted, ranging from the debates that we recently had in Hong Kong um, all the way to, let's say, the Middle East. So it's not only about the freedom to choose and to elect your leaders. It's much more about uh, institutions, about uh, issues related to equality or inequality, mentioned again earlier this morning. Uh, when when guys here were debating Piketty, uh, I think it's uh, it's a very wide topic, but a very pertinent time to discuss it. And I would end on the note that all the crises, including the economic crisis that we're facing right now, are 
in today's world, in today's era, global in their nature. So I think one aspect that's also perhaps worth debating maybe later on is uh, democracy in international government, in international governance, sorry. So talking about uh, more democracy and more uh, inclusion in international organizations, places like the United Nations, obviously, this is the place where, which I'm most familiar with, but also Bretton Woods institutions and, and some of the ad hoc uh, institutions that we've had in the last years, like the G20, and how they interact, involve, and work together with international organizations. This is also another thing which I believe is worth exploring. Thank you. Thank you so much. For your-, your remarks actually provide a, a very interesting transition to uh, Dora and what Dora has to say to us. Um, you're going to be addressing the, the issue, hopefully, of what, what do you mean by democracy, especially in you know, a, a crisis situation where people have been affected, where people have perhaps lost faith in institutions um, and governance as we've known it. Greece is a perfect example of uh, another teachable lesson um, for you know, the rest of Europe. So let us know what you... Well, thank you, Liz. Thank you for your invitation. Dear friends, the fear that the economic crisis is contributing to the rise of extremist forces slowly undermining both the legitimacy and the functioning of our political systems in given crisis-ridden countries is unfortunately strong and sound. I will make just five points on the phenomenon. First, the 20th century is indeed the most frightful reminder of the fact that two large totalitarian regimes grew out of the humiliation of war, but above all, the unemployment and destitution of large sections of the population. Authoritarianism in the form of military dictatorship often occurs in countries with no major economic problems also, but with the non-legitimized political systems or feeble political institutions. But totalitarianism and the rise of extreme ideologies in a democratic society appears unfortunately only when the ground is fertile with vast economic discontent. This is my first point. My second point is that the more statist and clientelistic a system, the more fragile and erosive it becomes in times of crisis. And by clientelism, I do not only mean the distribution of personal favors to specific voters as individuals, that stands also, I mostly mean the state's propensity to borrow in order to buy over the sympathies of large sections of the population, either through state appointments or what huge transfers of economic benefits to various social groups. When the crisis erupts, such favors necessarily have to stop, and the anger of the favored classes mounts. The third point is that the more sharply divided Prime Minister Simit has already mentioned that. The more sharply divided and historically loaded with bitterness against political rivals the system is, the more extreme this division grows in times of crisis. This favors a country's undemocratic forces. Why so? Because a crisis needs an explanation, and when the crisis is acute, many people are satisfied only with the harshest of explanations the fault for the collapse is always blamed on one's historical enemy. Thus, in Greece, for example, the right accuses the left for having paralyzed society with its anti-business and trade unionist approach, while the left blames the right for blind servility to the creditors and so on. And unfortunately, we are still going on in Greece today. It is a bitter exchange, and the result is that in the process, All parliamentary forces are mutually delegitimized in the eyes of the crisis-stricken people, and we know who profits. My fourth point is that when nationalism looms in the the minds of the people, because of the system of education, historical experience, and the media, 
The nationalism aggravates tensions both inside the country and in its relations with other countries, particularly the creditors. That also greatly favors the political extremes. <laughs> Nobody likes creditors, that's not news. But when this dislike becomes a blame game, a discharge of one's own responsibilities in the framework of, of conspiratorial theories cultivated by the media and by certain political forces, then no wonder that the ground is highly fertile for extreme political forces to profit and grow in importance. My fifth and last point is that exposure to or conflict with the other is also a main factor in aggravating this phenomena. Massive immigration into our countries, with all the social and economic consequences it entails, raises fear and suspicion, particularly to the least educated sections of the population. This part of the population, and not only, translate the accommodation with divergence and the tolerance of the democratic forces in a country as mere weakness or incompetence. They consequently turn their attention to the voice of those political forces who profess that they can deal decisively and radically with these issues. The situation is further aggravated when the immigrant countries or regions of provenance are perceived as cultural areas in conflict with the basic values of our civilization. Emigrants are then perceived not just as an internal inconvenience, but as a fifth column as well. See Sweden. The results in Sweden are, can just be explained by this fifth point. This all is butter in the bread of the political forces in the extremes of the political spectrum. These are five elementary points on the causes contributing to the rise of extremist forces in our society, ladies and gentlemen. And during the discussion, list, we can elaborate on them. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dora. Actually, your remarks provide a, a great jumping off point for um, a question that it would be great to hear the entire panel address, and that is, how do you incorporate the populist parties that have arisen recently as a result of severe economic crises in various countries, how do you incorporate them into the political system? Do you try to incorporate them into the mainstream, or does one try to keep them marginalized if they are considered extremist? In which case, how is that possible in a democracy? The fundamental point being that they have all arisen from uh, discontent with economic situation, which has led to problems in social situation, as well as immigration policies. Mr. Prime Minister, would you like to start? And then I would love to hear all of you. Uh, there are different phenomena. There are different phenomena. You cannot compare the party of uh, Mrs. Le Pen in France with Golden Dawn in Greece. So, uh, Mrs. Le Pen in France is a party widely accepted, working for over uh, many years in trying to change uh, the views prevailing in France and more nationalistic. But it is a party that functions in a democratic state and accepts democratic rules. So, uh, Golden Dawn is not the same case. Golden Dawn is nationalistic. It professes violence. It tries to destroy democracy. So you have to have a different policy towards the two cases. In any case, in Greece, in, uh, as far as Golden Dawn uh, is concerned, if they try to change the system by applying all the rules and the democratic rules, the state has to intervene, and it has intervened. In France, the same cannot happen. But I agree with Mrs. Barcoyani that education is very, very important. 
If in a country you have, as in Hungary, for example, this is also a region of the developments in Hungary, if you have a very nationalistic speech, you always speak about the great uh, past, what we were, uh, how the others are small in comparison to us, that we can change the world, that we have the best solution, then to help all these people that are populistic, nationalistic, and create a non-democratic system. So there are several levels where you have to combat uh, the extreme right, the nationalistic right, the right that, uh, or the left, which can be also the left, that is totalitarian. But a principle is in a democracy, we must apply democratic rules, then with this, in this way, we will uh, uh, make people to accept democracy and work for democracy. Well, <clears throat> I completely agree with Mr. Simitis. Um, you mentioned earlier uh, the Tea Party example in the United States. So um, let me just say, whereas I think that the, these groups are all different in what they advocate, um, in the case of the Tea Party, they s emerged on the scene um, playing into this issue of discontent in, in the United States, economic discontent. Um, and the way that we in the United States address um, radical points of view, which you may or may not agree the Tea Party is a radical point of view, but the way that we deal with it is through open, rigorous, plural debate, um, where you bring it into the public square, the agora, and you hash it out, and you allow people to formulate their own opinions, and what the hope is that, um, uh, that uh, reason will prevail. Uh, and you see, um, in some cases now, Tea Party candidates that are out of favor, especially if they advocate for um, government not engaging to solve the problems, but rather being um, obstructionist. Uh, in the situation in Hungary, as Mr. Simitis um, has already raised, uh, there has been, they have experienced a very sharp rise in the far right with the Jobbik party. And we have been advocating, the United States advocated when I was there, and I know that it's still the case, um, for the same thing. Open debate and dialogue that whether it's the government or civil society groups, that they stand up and they take on the political philosophy of the Jobbik party, which the United States, for one, did not consider to be a democratic party. It is only through those open dialogues and debates where, where someone stands up and, and uh, starts to express odious speech, um, hatred against minority groups, that rather than coming up with laws to make them stop talking, um, you call upon the um, those in society who recognize that this is not a good approach and um, that it's not what they want in their community, that they want to have a pluralistic, open, tolerant society, to stand up and debate with them in order to be able to minimize um, those vo voices in the public forum. So it is, in our view in the United States, it's, it's always um, the best approach. But as we all know, um, in any circumstance when people are hurting economically, um, they look for someone to blame. They look for scapegoats. They're, they're dissatisfied, discontent, and that often brings up um, the, uh, uh, the blame game and, and focusing on um, either individuals or groups and laying the blame um, rather than looking for solutions. Thanks. Uh, well, uh, really, for me, it's difficult not to go back to the uh, to the example of Serbia because we've uh, we've really gone through this situation and we've been going through the situation in the past ten years. And and if if, if I remember last uh, last time when I was here in this building, uh, Dora was organizing uh, a dinner for OSCE ministers of foreign affairs as a minister of foreign affairs of Serbia, and the guys who are taking over the presidency of the OSCE. Um, next year, uh, Serbia is going to be the chairman in office of the OSCE. Um, at a time where considered uh, somewhat of pariahs in international 
community having been associated with a previous regime that uh, we work, had to end up working very hard to overthrow. But uh, the early stage in Serbian democratic development uh, involved this kind of uh, cutting out certain segments of society. And it ended terribly wrong. It ended with an assassination of the prime minister. And then later on, I think that the attitude changed and we started having an inclusive attitude, much in a way that Madam Ambassador was describing. And it ended up, it, it ended up transforming the political spectrum, including the political parties that at the time were not uh, acceptable or not very easy to work with or, or even acknowledge as legitimate political forces in the society. So I'm, um, I'm very much um, in support of, uh, of what you were saying that uh, inclusion uh, but like through an open, rigorous, plural and uh, very, uh, let's say, in line with the letter of law debate is the way to push things forward. But then again, saying what I said before, it doesn't work everywhere. It worked in Serbia. It definitely works in the United States, but the United States is one of the you know, longest standing uh, uninterrupted democracies uh, in the world. Uh, I'm not sure that everybody would agree with, uh, with this, for example, in the Middle East, or you know, when we had a, a, an attempt to include uh, uh, everybody in, uh, say, Gaza, uh, in a democratic debate, and it, it did not end up with an intended result. Um, I think that the jury is still out on, uh, on, on what's going on in Egypt and um, the Muslim Brotherhood's uh, uh, participation in the future um, democratic polity of Egypt. But it's definitely a different world, and different rules and different contexts need to be taken into account. But um, here in Europe, which is where we're sitting and what we're discussing, given the results of the recent elections, I don't know, in Sweden or in Greece and so on and so forth, I'd go for, um, I'd go for inclusion, but with a strict application of law. Um, I believe somebody said uh, earlier on that uh, use the law <laughs> against them. <laughs> use the rules against them, because democracy, in the end of the day, at least in my understanding, is about the rules and the laws, and, and this is the very big strength of a democracy as a system of governance, and, and I think it, uh, it ought to be applied, in this case, uh, for sure. And Dora, that's a particularly tricky question here in Greece. It is a tricky question, and I think I'm going to say something which, against, which is against the majority, uh, majority's views. Look, the, the first rule in a democracy is that you cannot deny democracy because you want to achieve something. This is the first rule. So you have to stick to your democratic rules. And you are right, Vuk, rules and laws. Because that's what democracy is about. So if you deny yourself by trying to fight an extremist group, uh, it can become very dangerous. The second rule is that in a democracy, the, uh, the penalty is for the acts, for criminal acts, and not for ideas. So this must also be clear. And the third point is that we feel that we are very strong in our argumentation, and that they are wrong, and that we have much more arguments than they have. Now. We, rightly in Greece, penalized the acts of Golden Dawn. And we were absolutely right about that, because they acted in a criminal way, either towards uh, emigrants, very often, and we were very late there, or even towards people who have different ideas than them. But as always, unfortunately, in my country, this is the only country where we had to invent pan metron ariston for the very simple reason that we never, we always overcome ourselves. We went also to the other side and we don't discuss with them. And we don't have the debate and the dialogue, which is in my 
opinion also, Eleni, absolutely necessary. And this was, in my opinion, a mistake. We should bring them up on television, talk to them, debate with them, show that they don't have arguments, that they are naked. But because we don't debate them, they are somewhere at the corner of the political spectrum. Everybody believes that whatever he thinks, Golden Dawn believes it also, you know, whatever he wants, because they are never on television. The result is that they are here, even with 10 MPs in prison, they are here, and they have practically eight, nine, I don't know, 10% of the people, which means that we have, in my opinion, to change the way we are dealing with them. We have to be adamant on criminal acts, and on the political side, bring them up, debate them, and show that they have practically zero um, argumentation. Thank you. Thank you. One of the... Um one of the phenomenon that has fueled the popularity of parties like Golden Dawn or even the Front National in France has been the policy of austerity uh, that the European countries were compelled to adopt during the height of the Euro crisis. And, you know, as we mentioned earlier, this was an extraordinary period in which this phenomenon called the financial markets proved to be an incredibly powerful force one that, as it turns out, challenged democracy um, because they forced a number of countries to take decisions in, in hasty and, some would argue, non-democratic ways. Um, now we're seeing a Europe-wide backlash against austerity policies um, that have been pushed um, especially uh, by Brussels and by Mrs. Merkel in Germany. And while nobody would argue that countries should... Um, be allowed to kind of get away without fixing their financial balance sheets in, in the wake of this disastrous cri crisis, everybody has seen what the impact, the social impact has been and the political impact. Um, Mr. Simitis, maybe I could ask you, you know, is it right actually for um, there to be a backlash occurring against austerity policies? And if so, what uh, economic growth models are any of these countries going to have for the future? Um, a growth model that will basically put societies back on the right track, lower unemployment, and try, hopefully not get us to this scenario of a lost, the lost decade that a lot of people are talking about, because if you think about it, we're already almost halfway to a lost economic decade. As I said in my introduction, there are two problems. The first problem concerns the nation state and the second, the European Union. I must stress that in many states, in Greece also, people are thinking that we have the possibilities we had 30, 40 years ago or even 20 years ago uh, the nation state is autonomous. Reality is that the nation state is not any more autonomous and is not autonomous in the European Union. What happens outside Greece in the world, globalization, what China does, the United States plays an important role also for Greece and surely the decisions of the European Union that have been agreed by all member states play a much more important role than the national laws, rules. So, if there is a crisis, you have to work on both levels, European level and national level. Coming to the European level, I did mention but it is necessary to know that there is a democratic deficit. Why a deficit? Because in all member states, and according to democracy, the citizens decide on policies. 
in the European Union, the citizens don't, do not decide on policies directly. They decide through governments, through different uh, uh, organizations that the European Union has created. And uh, there is a big discussion about it, but uh, the prevailing opinion for those who say that there is a democratic deficit, and I can mention several proposals that have been made up to now, is that the structure must be changed. Well, there to what extent be... has austerity contributed to this democratic deficit? And, and I, I how can... austerity, yeah. yes, I can. Uh, there, there must be a European Parliament, a European Parliament for the Eurozone, uh, with members of all parliaments of the countries of the Eurozone, and this parliament, represented by parliamentarians of the Eurozone, will have to decide on the budget, to decide on the austerity policies, and whatever policy has to be applied. That's a way to overcome the democratic deficit. I can't say it's right or not. Uh, I think it's right, but in any case, a discussion is needed, and discussion has not taken place. Now, austerity policies. But austerity policies is not only a problem for some countries, it's also a problem of having another outlook or another aim for the policy of the Union. You don't go only for stability, you must also try growth. I may be you remember that when Mr. Delors was president of the Commission, Mr. Delors suggested a big, a vast program of changes in infrastructure of the European Union in order to help growth. When uh, Mr. Delors went and there were the new, uh, the new presidents, uh, Mr. Barroso, for example, said no more changes. We had enough changes. That's wrong. There must be a continually change, and a continually change in order to have growth in uh, the European Union. You know all the Greek problem, the discussions about the Greek problem. The Greek uh, government says we have done the necessary austerity, we have not a big deficit or no deficit at all, and so on. But that's a part of the problem. Because if you have not a deficit or a minimum of a deficit, you have not solved the problem. The problem is growth. How can you have more production? It's necessary to have more production. And this is not only a question of one country. Why? Greece, in 2000, uh, if I remember, 2004, had a deficit in uh, external trade for over 14% of the national product. Germany had a plus of 5 or 6%. And that is the great inadequacy, the great uh, uh, the reason for the crisis. The southern countries do not export or do not produce so much as the northern countries. And the solution must be found. For example, and they said uh, you have to have an economic governance in the European Union, that's out of the question, but it is possible also to have a European tax. It was suggested, for example, by a group of uh, French and German economists, because there are different taxes on corporations. In Greece, we have a tax of 36% of 36, I think. Uh, in this means that you cannot invest in Greece. You go and invest there, where the tax is 15%. So Let there must be a corporate tax for all the members of the Eurozone that's the same. And then on this corporate tax have also an addition, an addition for the Union. Let me, let, me, let me interrupt you there, if I may, and maybe you could 
continue during the question and answer session because we're running a little bit short on time. And I want to open up the, uh, the, to the audience questions so so for you. Uh, and, and, uh, and sorry, sorry. Uh, no, no, that's okay. But you ask me something that I will. Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so they say a tax of 25%, 5% for the union, 20% for the country, and so we can uh, work for growth. Thank you. Thank you so much. Before I open it to the audience for questions, and if you could please raise your hand so I can identify you ahead of time, I would love to ask Eleni just very quickly, um, from where you're sitting on the other side of the Atlantic, um, what is the perception of when Europe will turn around um, from the economic crisis that we are undergoing right now, and with the rise of populist forces that we have seen, how much of an alarm bell does that set off in the United States? Well, there are a lot of alarm bells ringing in the United States about events happening around the world, but what's absolutely critical is that Europe is strong. Uh, Europe and the United States are our first, th this, is, this is where we start, where we look for partners in dealing with the enormous challenges of the 21st century, and Europe must be economically strong and sound with its democracies um, uh, producing for people, as we've said. So it's very, very important. Now, we all know in the United States, um, we have had the ability to deal with our economic crisis with stimulus. And it has been, by all accounts, with its challenges, um, the right thing for us. Our unemployment rates um, have, uh, have dropped. Um, uh, our economies and pockets are coming back. In some pockets, they're raging. I, I live in um, San Francisco near Silicon Valley. Um, and I think the way that we look at, at the uh, situation in Europe is enough is enough. There have got to be growth policies in Europe in order to assure people that the pain that uh, they are going through with the austerity, with the rewriting of so many of the budgets, is going to lead in the right direction for them. It's going to pay off. So I think it's absolutely clear um, whether the official line from the United States or from those, for those of us who recognize the importance of a strong Europe, that growth policies are absolutely essential. Absolutely. Great. If we could open it up to the audience for questions. I'm sure there are some. I see a number of hands up. Let me call on this gentleman in the back. If you could identify yourself and also uh, identify the person to whom you would like to ask the question. And please, if you could keep it to questions rather than statements. I, I would not like to address someone particularly, but simply ask the following question. How do you see the, the issue of the loss what I call the loss of dual legitimacy. I will immediately explain. Uh, in Europe, we face the double phenomenon that you have, we have lost to some extent our legitimacy vis-a-vis -vis the nation state because its powers have been transferred to a central authority, which is the EU. And at the same time, as the EU is perceived as not being able to face the crisis uh, uh, in the member states, there is also a loss of legitimacy at that level as well. So you have in Europe a phenomenon of the loss of dual legitimacy loss. Member state, and this is one of the main reasons in, in my view why the extreme right or extremist forces in given countries uh, rise. Add to that also the fact that uh, Europe is perceived as weak at the international stage. This is crucial also. So I would like to hear the view whether this uh, loss of legitimacy, as I have already called it, does, in your view, play a role. Vuk, would you like to answer that? Well, uh, uh, like Madam Ambassador, I'm, I, I'm not coming from an EU state, but I mean, I come from a country that's very close to to Europe, and, uh, and as, as, as someone who's... Uh, Who's looking? Uh, who's looking into the European Union and uh, and uh, you know being part of a society that aspires to join the European Union despite this problem and despite some of the things that uh, the Prime Minister uh, did raise. Uh, I, I I think it's uh, it's um, on balance. There there is a smooth functioning in a democratic sense. 
We're not really having a direct democracy in Europe. It's not the Athenian uh, direct democracy, but I think it is. It is a system that uh, that relatively well um, represents through governments that are elected at the national level represents the views of the uh, of the European uh, citizens. But um, it's definitely this uh, this big question: austerity versus uh, versus growth and. Uh, and I'm, uh, I'm not really as competent as, as, as the Prime Minister for sure here to discuss it. Uh, I mean, I come from a political family, from the political spectrum that, uh, that believes in stimulus more than, uh, than in austerity. And, and I can tell you that the vast majority of my European friends uh, who, who I talk with, regardless of whether they come from right or left, are, are in that boat. Um, but it does require a democratic debate inside European institutions, and we're going back to to democracy and 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 back to institutions. Um, I'm in favor of growth and stimuli, but uh, but there are some people who are increasingly influential in the European Union who who don't really believe uh, in the same thing. Dora, add your voice. May I come back also a little bit to your first question about austerity and uh, the German approach? <coughs> I, I believe that a change is taking place in, in Europe. Um, and I think that more and more governments realize that uh, we have, okay, with the stability, as uh, Prime Minister Smith said, but now our issue is growth. So this change will be articulated. I believe, in the new commission, which will take over now. So it won't be like yesterday, and it won't be business as usual. Uh, we will see it, and I, see, I think we will see it clearly. We will not forget completely the stability, but uh, growth will be our main issue. And on the legitimacy, um, yes, we lost uh, part of our legitimacy uh, as uh, countries and as European Union. But I think the main reason is because inside we took democracy for granted and we also took Europe for granted. Well, both of them are not for granted. Democracy is a flower which has to be arose every day and Europe is an ongoing battle. It's a great achievement. It's just 50 years old. Uh, it was impossible to think of it a few years ago. It's a great achievement, but we have to work on it. And I must say, uh, Mr. Simitis, I like the idea about a parliament of the Eurozone. It would be a very interesting parliament. I don't know how, how much it will cost the European Union, but it would be a very interesting parliament. And it would deal partly with the question of the democratic deficit. And one would probably have to get over a number of political hurdles to actually see, see that institution being formed. Well, you but. know, parliamentarians are not very well liked in the <laughs> European Union because they, are always, they always create problems. But uh, fortunately for us, we are necessary for the functioning of democracy. Uh, we have several questions, so I see a couple of people in the back. Madame, if you could ask your question quickly and then we'll move on to... Uh, a couple of others. Esther Shandorfi, I'm the ambassador of Hungary, and uh, actually it's interesting. Let me quote my prime minister who once said that uh, uh, when he was asked about a membership to the EU, and he said, you know, if you don't sit around the table, you quickly find yourself on the menu. And now I feel a little bit on the same way. You know, I'm not sitting around the table there, and as the representative of my country, I quickly find myself, myself on the menu. <laughs> so I mean, so let me just comment uh, because Hungary was. You could ask a question. question if you could ask a yeah, question. Yeah, but, rather but than first, comment. just to comment. I mean, the ambassador Kunelaki referred to Prime Minister Orbán's speech. I would just like to add another phrase from the speech, which was not mentioned, namely, Hungary respects the values of Christianity, freedom, and human rights, and does not reject the fundamental principles of liberalism, such as freedom. This part is never quoted ever. Uh, the, the other thing also with the rule of law, that, that Hungary is the only country in the European Union 
whose constitution and legal system was scrutinized from the top to the bottom, and it was totally screened. And we had lots of very good discussion in the relevant bodies, also in the Council of Europe. We solved the, the majority of the problems. Uh, so that's to the legislation. I mean, we discussed a lot for the economy in the, in the first panel. It's also true that, that we, 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 it's necessary to, to think out of the box, and maybe we should just break up with this dogmatic approach that neoliberalism is the one and only way. I mean, the founding fathers of the European Union based on the Christian Democrat values, and we also incorporated a lot of the, the values of social democracy. Maybe we should listen a little bit more and look back to the founding fathers of the European Union. And now I, I would like to ask two questions. One, if the one Prime question Minister, if we could, because we're running short on time. Thank you. Uh, well, it's Please. difficult. <laughs> So, Prime Minister Simitis, I mean, your, your, during your period of time, ex, ex synchronismus modernization was, was really a major philosophy with large public investments and, and re labor reforms and, and, and infrastructure development, and that's what's actually happening now in Hungary, although it's officially, it's not a socialist, but a conservative government, but that's what happened in my country. I would like to hear your experiences uh, when you look back to this period and evaluate that. I also wanted to ask something to, to Foreign Minister Bakoyani. I don't know if, uh, if I may well, put up the question. We just have a very, we're actually running over time on it's the panel, just, so if I you could ask for the question about, afterwards, that would be really yeah, helpful. Yeah, for the Council Thank of you. Europe, but uh, okay. the role of the Council. If you could give a very brief uh, answer, Mr. Prime Minister, because I'd like to also, that's for, for you, Mr. Simitis, very briefly, and I, we have other questions back here before the next panel. Uh, when I spoke, I said that uh, when there is crisis, everybody says when there is a crisis, everybody agrees to change, but uh, implementing change is something very difficult because there are many interests, many structures of society, and uh, you cannot uh, realize what we want in a time of four or six or eight years. Sometimes much more is needed. And I bring an example also, and I close. Uh, perhaps you remember, if you know, that in 2001, my government proposed a change of uh, uh, social insurance. And uh, the unions were against, the opposition was against, and people were against. There were big rallies in Athens that this uh, should not be done. It was not done, but uh, 10 years after, in 2011-2012, uh, when the European Union said, if you want to get the money, you must change the social uh, uh, system, then uh, practically everybody agreed and it was made. But uh, you needed, the country needed 10 years to realize and the crisis to realize that uh, things were not going as people thought, but uh, a change was necessary. Thank you so much. Two more questions. We'll take this gentleman here and then that gentleman. Thank you. This is Konstantinos Bogdanos from Sky Television Athens. This is mostly a Vuk Yeremich inspired question, but maybe uh, Minister Bakoyanis would have something to add on that. Uh, Mr. Yeremich has been part of a transitionary cabinet in, in Serbia in what he called the aftermath of a democratic revolution. Now, this is a case where in a country that has been, as you have mentioned, very close to the heart of Europe, um, you have a transition from a regime to a democratic state of affairs. And that has been assisted in uh, a way by the West through OTPO or other means uh, in a well um, well-defined manner, let's say. But in the same uh, way that you, we try to establish democratic uh, um, states of affairs in Western nations, we also try to push for democracy in places of the world where democracy does not seem to have any roots um, so that it can blossom and flourish. 
therefore, you have um, an intervention in Afghanistan, so to speak, a CIA intervention in Afghanistan in the late 70s, on behalf of the free world, very well meant. And uh, okay, what then is, what is your question? the, the question we'll comes in, in a second, please. Yes. Um, then you have a George W. Bush um, in Iraq. Then you have the, the, the whole spring, so to speak. And although this is not felt intrinsically on the inside of European or Western democratic nations, there seems to be a certain repercussion that is called Islamist extremism. Now the question is, is the attempt to spread democracy worthy at all costs everywhere in the world? Thank you. A complicated, a complicated question. And that's why I'm going to take that. That's why I'm going to take a, a microphone and then perhaps let some other people have the hook in that. In that sense, uh, I was there in in the General Assembly at the time when, um, let's say, the uh, the spring, and you're probably referring to the Arab Spring, uh, started making its first, uh, let's say, coughs, and uh, and by now there is definitely. Um, a situation in which um, in which it is well worth uh, having a very a second look, especially uh, contrary to to what was uh, what was believed at the very beginning, especially in the Western media. Uh, my answer is uh, my uh, my short answer is no, but uh, but it's too short an answer. We don't have uh, too much time here to dwell into it. I. I personally do believe in democracy. I believe democracy um, is, is something worth uh, striving for. But we do live in a very complicated and a difficult world in which one has to be very, very careful as to how one proceeds with engaging with various countries and peoples around the world which they might perceive as interference in their own affairs. And if we could, uh, please feel free to come up to the to our panel members after afterwards to you know have a further dialogue. We have one more very quick question, and then we're going to move on to the next panel. Please, a question. Yes. Um, my name is Antonis Schwartz. I'm the co-founder of a parliamentary monitor organization called Wuli Watch, and um, I wanted to comment on open government and e-government. If you could please ask a question, rather we don't have time for comments. Yes. I'm sorry, right. but I'm. So, so I wanted to ask um, Mrs. Bakoyani if she thinks that winning back uh, the trust of the people should be a national priority for Greece, but also the European Union, because. My question is related to basically not only Euroscepticism, but general mistrust with politicians, that there is lack of transparency uh, with political finances. In Greece, for example, we have the problem with bl black political money, which hasn't been solved yet. So I think when we talk about the rule of law, this should be of fundamental importance. And uh, yeah, that is my basic question. Thank you so much. A brief answer, Dora. The answer is yes. I believe this is a main goal. It's a national goal, but it's also a European goal. And if we don't win back the, the trust of the people to the functioning of democracy, to democracy, to the politicians, then at the end of the day, uh, democracy will not function in any country and it will not function in Europe either. Because then the argument will be, well, you have the Gulf states prospering without a democracy. What a good idea this will be we will have some other kind of systems at the end of the day. So for us, for the people who are in politics for many years, this is our first goal. And unfortunately, uh, I don't believe that everybody realizes how bad uh, the situation is today, at least in Greece. Well, thank you so much. That's a really great transition, actually, to our next panel that will be led by Alison Smale. Um, taking a look at democracy uh, from a different angle from how it's covered in the media, which presents all sorts of other issues as well. Let's thank our panelists, and also please feel free to come up to them to ask questions afterwards. Yes, it's